Alexander Redding is Fanny Peabody Professor of Music at Harvard University. He obtained a PhD from the University of Cambridge in 1998 and went on to postdoctoral fellowships at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, the Penn Humanities Forum at the University of Pennsylvania and the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts at Princeton University before joining the music department at Harvard in 2003. As a music theorist, Alex focuses on intellectual history and media theory. This has taken his work in a number of different directions, from ancient Greek music to the Eurovision Song Contest and even into outer space. Alex's teaching and research has focused on German and European cultural and intellectual history from the 18th to the 21st century including such topics as music and identity, cultural transfer, historiography, eco-criticism, sound studies, media theory and digital humanities. He has served as editor for Acta Musicologica between 2006 and 2011 and editor-in-chief of the Oxford Handbooks online series in music from 2011 to 2019. He is series editor of the six volume Cultural History of Western Music by Bloomsbury. His contributions have been recognized with such awards as a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Jerome Roach Award of the Royal Musical Association and the Dent Medal awarded jointly by the Royal Musical Association and the International Musicological Society in 2014. His interest in integrating digital technology into teaching and research led him to found Harvard's Sound Lab in 2012. A recent research project with Daniel Chua examines the Voyager Golden Record, a collection of world music that NASA shot into outer space in 1977. And this was published as Alien Listening, Voyager's Golden Record and Music from Earth in 2021. He has also published monographs on Hugo Riemann and the birth of modern musical thought in 2003, music and monumentality, commemoration and wonderment in 19th century Germany in 2009, and Beethoven's Symphony No. 9 in 2017, as well as editing several other books and contributing chapters and articles to many more publications. He is currently working on the role of instruments in the shaping of musical thought and organising an international conference called Instruments, Interfaces, Infrastructures, an interdisciplinary conference on musical media, which will be held at Harvard University Department of Music in May 2023. And we are delighted to have Professor Alexander Redding with us today to present this guest lecture entitled How Can Music Help with the Climate Crisis? Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you so much, Denise. It's wonderful to be able to be here with you in this virtual space thanks to zoom which over the last few years we've all learned how to love and loathe uh, in equal measure um, but also it's great to see you again denise after all these years and thank you so much for everybody uh, for being here there may be some noises in the background still it's eight o'clock in the morning where we are and my kids are about to go off to school um, but hopefully we'll be able to do that without uh, uh, in without too many interruptions it's also really gratifying to see that we have a couple of um, ecological um, organizations in the audience which I find very exciting because it is great to speak to musicians but it's also great to speak um, to the other side of the equation. I hope we will be able to get some sort of dialogue going. Um, and now I'll start. In the 1990s, when I was an undergraduate, one of my professors made a startling comment. Literature in the 21st century claimed was going to be about the environment in the same way that the 20th century was about psychoanalysis. I remember thinking at the time that this was a crazy idea, but it turns out he wasn't wrong. It's not entirely clear whether we've reached the environmental equivalent of a Joyce or a Proust in the 21st century, but there is a considerable body of literature on ecological topic, topics from the last 20 years or so. 
some highlights from the growing canon of climate fiction, often abbreviated as cli-fi, include Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, Margaret Atwood's The Year of the Flood, Ian McEwan's Solar, Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, or for German readers, Frank Schätzing's Der Schwarm. In parallel, literary studies have kept up the pace. The branch of scholarship that is concerned with the environmental humanities and which started flourishing in the waning years of the old millennium is often known as eco-criticism, which is a burgeoning field in many English and literature departments. Other areas in the arts and humanities have similar developments, including my own field, musicology. The branch of the field that pays particular attention to ecological concerns is called eco-musicology. And now it's time for a confession. I used to harbor a certain skepticism vis-a-vis -vis this music, uh, we, so sorry, vis-a-vis -vis this movement. And there is a certain irony here because I believed I coined the term more or less inadvertently when I used it as the title for a rev review article that was published in 2002. That article pulled together three recent German book publications on the topic of music and nature. I suspected a trend, and since Germany had such a prominent green movement, I called it eco-musicology. That neologism made me chuckle, and I didn't think about it much for the next few years. Little did I know that about 10 years later, eco-musicology would become a thing. Aaron Allen's name must be placed front and center here. He and his eco-musicological colleagues have worked tirelessly towards increasing the field's recognition with websites, newsletters, a grove entry, and a field-defining edited volume that put eco-musicology on the map. Back in the 1990s, the critical gaze at the time was firmly focused on the concept of nature, which was fairly easy to deconstruct. Nature, ostensibly defined as that which is free from human influence and that which precedes human cultivation, is in fact always already defined in reference to the human take national parks and other nature reserves and, and wildlife refuges. These areas are carefully maintained by human rangers to preserve exactly the same ecosphere, and this part is crucial, give off a pleasing aesthetic effect for human recreation. My favorite example is when Germany's first state park, the Bavarian Forest, conducted an audacious experiment in the 1980s. They did the unthinkable and stopped any human interference, any kind of maintenance in one carefully designated area to see what would happen. In other words, they let nature be nature in the full sense of the word that we usually employ unthinkingly. What happened was obvious. The landscape changed rapidly and dramatically, especially after an infestation of bark beetles killed off vast swaths of the forest. That wasn't all bad. In fact, ecologists noted that the new trees that started growing there instead are a lot more diverse and healthy. But the visitors in the park felt duped in their enjoyment of nature and the complaints started coming in instantly. Humanists at the time in the 1990s and early noughties had a field day deconstructing nature with abandon. It was common to only touch the term with the conceptual tweezers of scare quotes to declare it was nothing but a social construct. However, for all the deconstructive fervor, most of the critiques missed their target. Nature may have been a social construct, but environmental issues were real and couldn't simply be deconstructed away. After all, as philosopher Kate Soper tartly pointed out at the time, it wasn't language that had a hole in, his own, in its ozone layer. This stinging critique was also applicable to much eco-musicological work during that early phase. There was a lot of enthusiasm and goodwill, but connections to environmental science or policy weren't always clear. I suspect that part of the problem was that we took the established repertoire and scoured these familiar works to see what we could say about them in the context of nature. Cue Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, which was probably the most overwritten work at the time. There was excitement and a freshness in this work, but there was one thing that it didn't do. Um, for a branch of scholarship that wanted to make the world a better place, that set out to inject their scholarship with activism, this direction seemed of little immediate concern to the ecological disasters that increasingly engulfed the planet. A common criticism of these efforts was this. 
if you want to save the world, then do that. But music criticism really doesn't help solve the cri climate crisis. Harsh, but probably fair. Another way of putting this is that during this early phase, we simply slapped the prestigious eco label in front of musicology as a seal of approval, but changed relatively little about what we mean by music or by extension by musicology. But what would happen if we took the other side of the hyphen equally seriously and changed musicology, approaching it from the prefix eco? I think an eco musicology that's worthy of its name should would have to make sure that both parts are in balance and equally weighted, weighty. I even see this as an opportunity. Once we start um, looking at ecological thought, the music that raises the most productive questions is not necessarily the music that we're accustomed to. It pushes us into regions where we need to redefine what we mean by music. How do we use music to formulate a rallying cry for action? How do we widen our temporal horizon beyond the next electoral cycle and take meaningful action? How do you shout, act now in music. There are two issues here. One is the devilish temporality of climate change. We need to change now, in fact, right now, this very second, but the effects of our behavior will become apparent only much later. And for the very same reason, it's so easy not to act because our behavior causes no immediate discernible change. That's why polluters have been able to go on for so long with impunity. And the second reason that using music has been so hard is, as always, music's non-representationality. There have been any number of phenomenal novels and especially films that scare the bejeebies out of its audiences, from Avatar to Dry Day After Tomorrow to Wally -E and Don't Look Up, or the most recent version of Dune, the narrative arts have always been especially successful at instilling a sense of the apocalyptic. They show us the dreadful effects of our actions and of our inaction in gruesome detail. Music, certainly music without a text, does not have the same representational powers, and it's at something of a disadvantage when it comes to the question of how best to raise awareness. We'll return to the question of what music can do to help a little later. But before we get there, let's talk a little more about what's been happening in ecological thought in the last few years. The term Anthropocene is probably so well known that it doesn't need much explaining. The concept proposes that now we live in a geological age, and that's the scene part of the word, which is essentially shaped by human interference, and that's the Anthropos part. The Anthropocene was accepted by vote in the International Geological Society in 2008, and it officially replaced the Holocene, the geological epoch in which we had been living for the previous 11,700 years or so since the end of the last ice age. Now, we know that we have an Anthropocene, but we don't yet know exactly what it is and where it started, when it started. The working group on the Anthropocene is still deliberating these points, though they're nearing completion. And um, about a week ago, there was a big announcement that they were coming to the end of their work. Um, most commentators opt for a starting point with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, when the burning of fossil fuels began on a large scale. Geologists generally prefer the less fuzzy date of 1945, and that's also the um, direction in which the committee, the working group, is leaning. 1945, when the US military started testing atom bombs in the New Mexico desert, which left a clear and unmistakable mark on the geological record. Others still have argued that the date should be pushed back to circa 1610, when the effects of the American conquest left a mark in the atmospheric record that's called the Orbis Spike. Still, on the, global, on the glacial timescale of geological records, these temporal differences are negligible. The term Anthropocene has also been contested. Critics have rightly pointed out that the footprint on the geological record is not the same from all humans, but that it's an effect of the forces of industrialization, colonization, and ultimately slavery and capitalism. It's the white first world global north that is the driving force behind the Anthropocene. To add insult to injury, the effects of climate change will, of course, be felt much more acutely in the global south. 
To give a better sense of this imbalance, other terms such as capitalocene, plantationocene, technocene, or even cthulhucene have been proposed instead. I have a lot of sympathy for these critical stances, but the field of geology thinks in time spans so vast that humans never really come into the picture. So from a geological perspective, the crucial element is the simple fact that humans emerge as a climate agent. And I will continue to use the widely accepted term Anthropocene. Another way of putting this is that from a purely disciplinary perspective, perspective geologists are ultimately fairly indifferent to the demise of humanity. The whole history of humanity is just a blip on their radar. Um, but of course, this blissful disinterest that geology puts forth is not shared by everybody. After all, when most of us think of the Anthropocene, we are immediately reminded of the fact that our days collectively are numbered. We think of the Anthropocene as a problem that we need to solve while the doomsday clock is ticking. From a humanistic perspective, what the Anthropocene foregrounds is a new and radically different conception of human and nature. Nature is not some overwhelming force that threatens and dwarfs humans and that can in turn be tamed and dominated by science and technology as the West imagined more or less for the last five centuries or so, but we do better to think about humans and nature as inextricably connected and intertwined. This is perhaps the time for our first musical example. One practical application of this kind of eco-musicological thinking is Pharrell Williams's song called 100 Years. I would like to play you this song, but I can't. And that's sort of the point. That's because this song is a kind of ecological Rube Goldberg machine. Let me explain. In 2017, the pop singer Pharrell Williams recorded a song and had it pressed specifically on a single record. This record is made out of clay and it will disintegrate when it gets wet. The record was played only once at an exclusive launch party in Shanghai and that's um, a recreation of that event by my daughter um, who is really into cartooning. Um, so there is, you know, there is no um, no actual footage of that launch party because they were asked not to film it, so we had to recreate it. Um, an exclusive launch party in Shanghai, and everybody who was there was sworn to secrecy. The rest of us can only assume that the song is mind-blowingly awesome. Now, this single record is kept in a safe in the vault of a French castle relatively close to the sea. It's located just above water level and the door will open, the door of the safe will open automatically in exactly 100 years, in 2117, 2117. Now it's basically up to us to decide what we do with this information. If the water level keeps rising at the current rate, then the record will be ruined by the time it becomes accessible and the music will be forever lost. Or put more accurately, we will have destroyed the music with our inaction. It's a precarious time capsule. If on the other hand, we are interested enough in hearing the song at the other end of the waiting period, then we will find a way to keep the water level low enough. Hashtag if we care. It's a kind of network that builds human behavior into the equation and in turn assigns agency to the music. Think of it as a marshmallow experiment for humanity that dangles a reward in front of us if we behave not in a way that makes us feel good right now, but rather if we practice impulse control and take the rational view by focusing on the future good. Pharrell Williams' 100 Year Song is a useful example in that it shows us how music can be an active force in changing our behavior and guide us toward a more environmental consciousness with real world, <laughs> with real world uh, consequences. The song applies a certain instrumental logic to music. It pivots on the fragile materiality of the recording and the artistic value of the intangible music. In this way, Pharrell's record is both carrot and stick both moral incentive and reward at the same time. Admittedly, this project has many issues. 
there is something unseemly about the assumption that we all collectively desire Pharrell's music so much that we're willing to drop everything we're doing and realize the error of our ways purely to be able to give future generations the pleasure of hearing this song. Then there's also the fact that this project is underwritten by a producer of Luxury Cognac. The whole thing is a publicity stunt, advertisement. And in fact, when I said earlier that I couldn't play the song, that wasn't quite true. There is, of course, a promo for this song, and it contains a few seconds of music from it. Let's hear it. And I should warn you that it starts very loudly, very suddenly. Um, but that's just, you know, we, we only have five seconds of it. So be warned. Hey! That's clear, right? Okay, that was it. That's all we have of this song. For all the problems with Pharrell's song, there is something intuitively right about the circumstance that our present predicament brought about by the extractivist tendencies of capitalism should also be solved by the same capitalist logic. What Pharrell or his financial backers seem to have realized is that all we, we all need an incentive to change our behavior. After all, most of us know that climate change is a global threat and yet we don't act on it. We need to be given a reason why we should care. Part of the problem is that climate change is simply too vast to take it all in. There are so many different things happening to the climate, so many ways in which we as humans would need to change our lives, that it's all too easy to just throw up our hands in despair and to carry on as if nothing was wrong. What we need to develop is a sense of solidarity with future generations, with people we don't even know and plan ahead well into the future. So let's try something slightly different. How can we bring the vastness of climate change down to a more manageable size? The philosopher Timothy Morton has proposed the term hyperobject. In the first place, it's an object that's so vast that we cannot perceive its boundaries. Hyperobjects are so, and I quote, massively distributed in time or space relative to humans that they completely envelop us. Hyperobjects are real and concrete, but they have no palpable reality for us. They're so expansive that we cannot grasp them. It's easy to see how climate change is a hyperobject. The time spans involved are so vast, the devastating changes are so gradual, and the link between cause and effect is so stretched out that none of these circumstances encourage immediate action, even though on a rational level, we all know that swift and decisive action is precisely what is needed. Intriguingly, when Morton introduces the hyperobject, he repeatedly draws on music to explain what its concept means. Music's evanescent materiality surrounds us, but withdraws from access in the same way as other hyperobjects. And music is very good at forging communities, even among people who don't know each other. How can we capitalize on this unexpected and fortunate connection between music and climate change? There are clever ways in which music has been instrumentalized in the service of giving us a sense of how hyperobjects operate. And this could be key for future work in ecomusicology. So now it's time to look at another music example, this time a much longer one. Jem Feiner's composition Long Player takes place in an old lighthouse at Trinity Boy Wharf in London. But it's not just any lighthouse. Significantly, it's situated directly across the Thames from the Millennium Dome, the centerpiece of the UK's official celebration of Y2K, located right on the zero meridian that runs through Greenwich. From this subtly distanced position in the old lighthouse, Finer launched his own millennial celebration. In a little dig at the official national celebration of Cool Britannia, which was eager to claim the third millennium as Britain's own, Long Player began its performance on December 31st, 1999 at 12 noon. That is 12 hours too soon, at the time when the new era dawned along the international dateline on the other side of the globe. At that moment, the deep resonant bronze timbres of Tibetan singing balls sounded the start of a musical performance that will go on for exactly 1000 years from Y2K to Y3K. Singing bowls are typically associated with Buddhist meditation practices. 
But despite appearances, there is nothing meditative, let alone new age, about Longplayer. Jem Feiner first rose to fame in the 1980s as a founding member and banjo player of the Celtic punk band The Pogues and invented himself as a composer and conceptual artist. For this project, he made good use of his background in computer science and conceived of Longplayer as a problem-solving exercise that was primarily concerned with temporality. In this thousand-year performance, the Tibetan singing bowls are not played by human musicians. The synthesized sounds of the bronze bells, bronze instruments are handled and coordinated by a network of computers. Even though the performance of long player is anchored in the lighthouse, it is not located anywhere in particular. The synthesized bronze bells can be heard at various points across the globe, from Sydney to San Francisco, in listening stations that were established in those places. The piece can now further be listened to on live stream on the internet. There's even an app. Even when there's no one to listen, the performance perpetually surrounds us. Right now, what's playing is this. Okay, that was just a couple of seconds. Despite its extravagant length, this millennial composition is, at bottom, a conventional composition. It even has a score, and here we see it. None of us will be around to hear the end of Long Player on 31st of December 2,999. Given the alarming rate of global warming, this piece may well last into the end of the world. This sounds terrifying. But Long Player has some important lessons to offer that may help us change our situation for the better. This sounds like a paradox, so I will start by clarifying some terms. When I say the end of the world, this is not the same as the demise of the planet. Earth will likely continue to rotate around the sun long after humans have ceased to be. But the world, in its specific anthropocentric flavor, will inescapably perish with humanity. What we have to learn then to avert the catastrophe are the fundamental lessons of ecology, how to think beyond our own selfhood, our own narrow interests, and to modify our behavior with the view to the most distant future. This is where the hyperobject comes into play. It tries to achieve two things, both in tension with one another. It seeks to preserve a sense of intimacy, but to drop the concept of selfhood. It asks us to care, and that's the intimacy part, but not for our own sake, but for that of others, of future generations. Even though we will not know them personally, the hyperobject forges a connection from us to unknown future generations, to our children's children. The hyperobject makes the emphatic aesthetic argument that any selfless investment that we make now will offer rewards to those who come after us. And this is where long player comes in. It gives material shape to a vast stretch of time that is otherwise impossibly hard to imagine. It binds us to those unknown future generations. We will not be around to hear the end of the music, um, but we project that others will. In fact, the story of Long Player is not only that of a thousand year long composition, but it is also the story of its sustainability. When confronted with temporalities of such extreme length, musical questions that normally require little to no thought must be carefully thought through. How can I write a score and on what material that will be readable over 1000 years? How can I ensure that the instruments stay tuned across the centuries and across natural disasters, wars and famines? Feiner is conscious of the irony that the computer technology on which his performance relies will be obsolete in just the next few years, let alone a thousand years. What reliable energy source can be drawn on uh, to sustain a performance over this time? The issues swirling around long player boil down to the question concerning technology. When studying Feiner's notes and sketches and the brown paper um, on the right of the slide shows some of the sketch material. It goes much further. It's a very, very long paper roll, I think, that he used, and it's full of those uh, thought bubbles. Um, it is striking that the bulk of Feiner's preparation work is not 
compositional in any traditional sense, but it's always connected with the monumental logistical challenge of this task. The biggest question remains the issue of long-term sustainability. And it is still an unresolved issue over two decades after the performance has started. But it would be wrong to regard this open question as a flaw in the musical work. It is a feature, not a bug. The issue of how to sustain the performance over the entire period of time is instrumental to the artwork and its answer must emerge in real time. Feiner holds out hope for gravity as a motivating force and energy source, but so far he relies on conventional electricity to power his computers, even though he knows this cannot be a long-term solution. He has experimented with a scaled down version of the score that is more suitable for human dimensions, at a thousand minutes rather than a thousand years. That is, a thousand minutes is 16 hours, for, uh, 16 hours 40 minutes. So a live performance on 234 different singing balls is still a significant time commitment for an ensemble of fleshy musicians and their audiences. This realization that the most sophisticated technology must eventually give way to human power is a maneuver that underlies much futurology and science fiction. In Andy Weir's novel, um, The Martian, for instance, an astronaut finds himself stranded on Mars and survives by rediscovering agriculture. After the most advanced rocket science has failed, the humble potato saves him. And the question asked by Rob Moss and Peter Gallison's documentary, Containment, how to warn future generations about the dangers of nuclear waste across a vast time span when language and graphic symbols will fail, is answered by plain manpower. The radioactive sites must be protected by human guards in perpetuity. In each of these cases, the return to human power is not a gesture of triumphant humanity, but simple elbow grease in a chain of actions necessary for a communal purpose. The human does not tower above the world, but is a necessary link in the chain required for plain survival. And this is what makes long player a hyperobject. It displaces the human from the center and assigns him the part of a bit player, with the gaze firmly fixed forward into the future. The human becomes a custodian, ensuring that the performance continues. The knowledge that there will be one day when long player draws to a close, that it has an end, a goal and a purpose, is reason for Feiner to express an optimism for an uncertain future. If the piece ends, there's a good chance that someone will be around to bring, this to this, bring it to this point in the performance. And who knows, maybe there is even someone there who listens to the end of the music. The musicians who bring the piece to a close at the far end of the millennium may or may not be human in a way that we would recognize. But the task of sustaining a piece of music over a thousand years may be just what's needed to square the circle of intimacy without selfhood that makes up the basic paradox of ecological thought. Finance long player creates a whole without holism. It creates a purpose to connect us across time with our unknown descendants, in the most distant future. Precisely by imagining a future without ourselves, the musicians or those who see to it that the music be completed become guardians of the future. Various thinkers who worry about the future have come up with criteria that will help us get out of our obsession with the present and turn our gaze toward the future and the monumental tasks that lie ahead. Stuart Brand and Danny Hillis the inventors of the clock of the long now identify longevity, maintainability, transparency, and evolvability as key features for projects designed to exist into an unknown future. The same criteria apply to long player. The piece must be simple enough to be readable even by future generations, and it must contain enough complexity in its musical sounds to sustain interest. The self-sustaining nature of the composition with multiple computer systems backing each other up to avoid any interruption of the performance supports the idea of a music that generates and regenerates itself. The motivating force and the reward, in short, the pleasure for humans to engage in the support of long player consists 
in seeing the composition unfold over time to its end. Sound art has often staged an emphatic now. By contrast, long player urges us to leave our sense of now behind and turn our ears toward the future, in a word, to care. If we attend to it, it can teach us what Marsha Bjornerud has called timefulness. It forces us to project into the distant future a thousand years from now, work backwards from there to the present moment, and figure out in concrete terms how we will get from here to there. This future-oriented approach to problem solving has justifiably been characterized as ecological thought. If we succeed in embracing hyperobjects such as long player, if we learn how to listen to the resonance of those bronze bells, we may have a chance of survival. It's about time. Thank you.